On the 3rd of October 1957, the Earth had one satellite, the Moon. On the 4th of October 1957, it had two, with the addition of the Soviet Sputnik 1, the world's first artificial satellite. And although it only stayed in orbit for 22 days, it opened floodgates. And today, we have about 11,833 active satellites in orbit. But that is expected to rise dramatically over the next decade or so with the rise of the mega satellite constellations like SpaceX's Starlink. But how many satellites can we put into orbit before things start to go wrong? And if it does, can we actually do anything about it? Now that 11,833 doesn't account for all the non-active satellites and launch vehicles and debris from launches and even collisions dating back to 1958 with Vanguard 1. Vanguard 1 was the first US satellite to orbit the Earth and only the fourth to be launched. It was also the first to have solar power and yet unlike Sputnik which burned up on the 4th of January 1958, Vanguard 1 is still up there nearly 67 years later after its 90 day planned mission was over. It actually kept transmitting for over six years in total. The grapefruit-sized craft was sent up to determine the total electron count between the satellite and the ground stations. It's in a medium Earth elliptical orbit, between 654 kilometers at its closest point and just short of 4,000 at its farthest. Its original orbit was estimated to last about 2,000 years, but after the discovery of the solar radiation pressure and atmospheric drag, this has been reduced down to about 240 years. Both Vanguard 1 and its launch vehicle, as well as Vanguard 2 and Vanguard 3 and their launch vehicles, are still in orbit around the Earth and will be for about the same amount of time as Vanguard 1. One of the main things that the Vanguard missions helped to discover was that the effect of the atmospheric drag up to 800 kilometers was the largest perturbing force, and above 800 kilometers, solar radiation pressure was the largest perturbing force. Both of these are strongly affected by the solar cycle. The lower the orbit of a satellite becomes, the greater the drag from the Earth's very thin upper atmosphere. This drag causes the speed of a satellite to decrease, which causes the orbit to decrease even more until the atmospheric friction becomes so great that it burns up. This may sound like a bad thing, but it actually turns out to be a very good thing because it's now estimated to be approximately 128 million pieces of debris in orbit, with some 900,000 being over one centimetre in size. That might sound very small, but at relative speeds of up to 58,000 kilometres per hour, even something the size of a grain of rice can punch through the side of a satellite quite easily. One of the glass windows of the cupola on the ISS is believed to have been cracked by a similar sized piece of debris, and at this speed even flecks of paint can become very dangerous. Most of these small pieces come from collisions with existing launch hardware, rocket bodies, defunct satellites, and even deliberate destruction of satellites in anti-satellite weapons tests. Atmospheric drag is nature's way of cleaning up the space just above the Earth. And the lower the orbit is, the more quickly the debris is cleared away as it burns up on re-entry into the atmosphere. But things are going to get a lot busier because of the new mega constellations of small sats currently being deployed. SpaceX's Starlink will have 12,000 satellites by the mid-2020s. Shanghai Spacecom's G60 Kinfan will have 14,000 satellites by 2030. Amazon's Project Kuiper will have 3,236 satellites and OneWeb 648 satellites. And this is not the end of the list or the expansion of existing constellations. Starlink alone is seeking permission for just under 30,000 more satellites. And then there are more constellations in the planning, as well as military versions like Starshield, the military version of Starlink operated by the US Department of Defense. There will no doubt be multiple military variations of this kind of thing, which will be operated by other spacefaring nation states, and all on their own terms. 
Just as the space above our heads is undergoing a revolutionary change, then so too is the tech workspace with regard to AI. Before I started this channel, I ran several businesses, all of which were online. And as they were startups, I had to program the websites myself in PHP and MySQL, which was a pretty time consuming job. But our sponsors today, Hostinger, have created an AI system called Horizons that allow you to build almost any type of online application without the need to do any programming, providing you have a fairly clear idea of what you actually want. So to test this out, I created a simple app that I needed to use to work out the time differences between two cities, something which I'd found to be rather confusing over the years. For example, if someone wanted to make a phone call from Los Angeles to Bangkok in Thailand at 3 p.m. Bangkok time, what time would it be Los Angeles time? If we go to Los Angeles is where we're starting from, and we want to know at 3 p.m. in Bangkok time, what is that at Los Angeles? And it's 14 hours ahead, and here it is. When it's 1500 in Bangkok, Thailand, it'll be one o'clock in the morning in Los Angeles. Now this was done in about 15 to 20 minutes with no programming and everything, the formatting of the text, the drop downs was all done with prompts. And in fact, there were 10 prompts which created this. This was the initial one, which was to basically say, um, create uh, input for two times, one being destination, one being local, and then to work out the difference between them. It then had just the time in the drop down here and here, so I said add the cities, and it did that. Uh, then I wanted to know the difference. The destination is, was it ahead or behind? And here it says it's 14 hours ahead. So it will tell you the difference there. And then give a clear summation of the difference. So this is the part here. So if you now go to um, London to Los Angeles, what time will it be in London when it is 1,300 hours in Los Angeles? And it will be eight o'clock in the evening when it is one o'clock in Los Angeles. And that is it. That is the whole thing, which can now be deployed anywhere in the world on a website. And it was all done with just 10 prompts. Once you have done, you can go live with just one click. And with hosting are covering all of your web hosting, domains and emails in one place. It's also risk free with a 30 day money back guarantee. So use my code CuriousDroid and the link in the description below to get 10% off of your first month of hosting a Horizons. Satellite constellations are networks of satellites designed to work together, providing global coverage for various purposes like communication, navigation and Earth observation. This allows coverage at or near global levels. Normally, this will be done by satellites in a geosynchronous orbit, 35,768 kilometers out. Here, they are in sync with the rotation of the Earth, and as such, they always sit over the same area of the globe. But at this distance, and the fact they are just single satellites means that their bandwidth is much less, and the time delay to get the signals there and back adds a significant delay. With a constellation, there are many more satellites moving over the receiver all the time and their distance is normally around about 500 kilometers which means that the time delay is a fraction of that compared to geosynchronous satellites this and the combined bandwidth which can be into the hundreds of megabits per second makes them far more practical and cost effective from an operator and an end user's point of view these new low earth orbit constellations are providing services like broadband internet connection into the hundreds of megabits per second or mobile phone coverage for areas that are too remote to have normal land-based connections. They also allow for much greater maritime and aviation connectivity. In fact, the videos which are beamed back from the SpaceX test launches of the Starship are sent via Starlink. The issue here is that all these new constellations will dramatically increase the number of objects orbiting the Earth, which could lead to more collisions and more debris. And if a runaway collision cascade were to occur, we could end up facing the Kessler syndrome. This is where the debris from a single collision could, in theory, collide into other satellites, which in turn collide into more satellites, and so on and so forth, creating a self sustaining chain reaction of collisions and fragmentation until there is so much debris that even space launches and things like space stations are at risk 
of damage or destruction. This could make certain orbital regions unusable possibly for hundreds of years until they are gradually cleared out by the atmospheric drag. From 2002, the FCC required all operators of satellites serving US territories that could not be safely deorbited that they had enough fuel on board at the end of their life to be moved to a graveyard orbit. That's one that is high enough, usually beyond the geosynchronous orbits, but it will be well out of the way and will take millions of years before it will make its way back to Earth. With the advent of the mega constellations, each of these small sats don't carry enough fuel to be moved to a graveyard orbit. They only have enough for avoidance maneuvers. Instead, they are required to have orbits which will passively decay into the Earth's atmosphere when the satellites are shut down or run out of maneuvering fuel so that they can burn up within a year of their end of life. To enable this, satellites are placed into different orbital shells or orbital altitudes. These include the very low Earth orbit from 100 to 450 kilometers, low Earth orbit up to 800 kilometers, medium Earth orbit from 2000 to 35,786 kilometers, geostationary orbit, which is also 35,786 kilometers, and high Earth orbit. The mega constellations will be in the lowest two, very low Earth orbit and low Earth orbit up to 800 kilometers. But within these orbits, there can be multiple layers as well. For example, in December 2022, SpaceX gained approval to launch an additional 7,500 satellites for its Gen 2 constellation into three low Earth orbital shells, 525, 530 and 535 kilometers. So here you can see the separation is just five kilometers in altitude between the orbital shells. Newer satellites also include collision avoidance, where they can either be told or automatically perform maneuvers to avoid known debris or potential collisions with other satellites. Starlink satellites are designed to be maneuverable and can execute maneuvers to avoid collisions if the onboard software calculates the probability of a collision to be higher than 1 in 100,000. But this is actually a lot less than the 1 in a million that NASA requires. In the first half of 2024, Starlink's fleet of satellites performed almost 50,000 collision avoidance maneuvers. And bearing in mind, these satellites are traveling at 7.8 kilometers per second or 4.8 miles per second. However, according to the FCC, each Starlink only has enough fuel to make about 350 corrections, which is expected to last around about five years. But the busier the orbits get, that might come around a lot quicker. Another issue is that as time goes by and the more of these mega constellations come online, the more we will be dependent upon the services they provide. Should at some point there be a cascade failure, it could severely affect services that will become dependent upon. The amount of money which is being made for constellation owners is already into the billions of dollars per year, and Starlink's projected revenue is expected to reach 15.8 billion per year by 2030, with over 20 million subscribers. This would eventually outstrip the revenue from SpaceX's launch business, meaning that SpaceX would be more reliant on Starlink for its revenue than its launch rockets. So what is the upper limit of how many satellites we can fit into the Earth's orbit without the whole thing becoming a giant multi-lane highway pileup? Well, as we've seen, it depends upon where the satellites are placed. If they're in low Earth orbit, even if their thrusters fail at the end of emissions, a satellite orbiting at 400 kilometers will be brought down by the atmospheric drag within about a year or so. But if that same satellite is at 1,000 kilometers, it could remain up there for hundreds of years. Experts in satellite safety say that in 10 years from now, there could be between 20 and 100,000 satellites in orbit around the Earth. And if that figure is nearly 100,000, many are skeptical that such a number of satellites can be operated safely. As with climate change, the only way we will know when we've reached the limit is when things start going wrong. And like climate change, by then it will probably be too late to do anything about it. At the moment, unlike satellites in geostationary orbit, which is a very coveted place to be, and only allocated to those on a first-come, first-served basis by the International Telecoms Union, 
satellites in low Earth orbit have only their own national bodies to regulate them and are under no obligations to coordinate with others. When all the new mega constellations are in place, some have said it will be like having multiple interstate highways all crossing each other at rush hour in a snowstorm with no stoplights and everybody driving far too fast. There are initiatives to locate and deorbit the most dangerous pieces of space junk, but like many things in commercial business, if it doesn't affect the bottom line in a positive way and there is a race to dominate the market, there will be far more incentive to putting up new satellites than getting the old ones down and out of the way. Even the best run space agencies can make mistakes. Envisat, the largest civilian operated satellite at the time, was launched by the European Space Agency in 2002 with a planned mission life of five years, but it was kept going for 10 years before it became unresponsive to commands in 2012. This eight ton satellite measuring 26 by 10 by five meters is now classed as space debris and will take 150 years for its current 774 kilometer orbit to decay and it will burn up. However, it is on an orbit which takes it within just 200 meters of two other known debris objects each year. If just a single 10 kilogram piece were to collide with it, it would create a very large debris cloud that could initiate a Kessler syndrome scenario. And with possibly 100,000 small sats in orbits not that far away, if that happens, it could be a very bad day for the whole space industry. So I hope you enjoyed the video. And if you did, then please thumbs up, share and subscribe. And a big thanks go to all of our patrons for their ongoing support.